Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Kings. 2 Kings, verses 42 to 44. Under the heading, Elisha feeds 100 men. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God. 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha says, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He said it before them, they ate and had some left, according to the word of God. God of abundance, open us to your word and your way as we chew on this text. Amen. Let me begin with a confession. Historically, I have not spent much time studying the book of 2 Kings. Just hasn't been one of my go-tos over the years. So when I read this text from the lectionary, I was eager to explore it. And uh, perhaps I'd read it over the years in the past, but I, I, I certainly didn't remember. It read to me anew. And as I read it, I was reminded yet again that stories I have known since I was a little girl about Jesus feeding the 5,000 have deep, deep roots. Jesus feeding the multitude in and of itself is a profound story, sometimes called the miracle of the loaves and fish, sometimes called the miracle of the boy who shared his lunch. But when Jesus performed this miracle, he wasn't just exampling God's abundance for his community. He was doing that, but he was also attesting to the ongoing work of God that spans centuries and even millennia. I was humbly reminded that the power of God's abundance in the face of human scarcity is a message so much bigger than even I have imagined. And let me be clear that over the decades, my imagination of God's provision and abundance has grown and grown and grown. And yet there's many more ways for it to grow. In fact, I dare say that the lesson itself of God's abundance in my life has continued to multiply. As my needs have increased, God's provision and abundance has exponentially increased. And God's provision goes further back than Elisha. Because as I studied this text, I was reminded that the miracle of Elisha's was meant to show that Elisha was part of the prophetic tradition of Elijah. And as Elijah provided food in a miraculous way, that was part of the greater tradition of Abraham. And of course, it's the Israelites in the wilderness to whom God provided food, and even back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve received the food of the garden because of God's provision. This is an ancient story. This is a story that our spiritual ancestors have learned again and again and again, and a story that we ourselves 
are invited to learn anew with each passing day, with each passing need, with each passing situation when it feels like there just might not be enough. Certainly when we look at things through our human eyes. But the biblical story is that when you have a need, indeed especially when you have a need, that is the opportunity to receive in miraculous ways the abundance of God. Another confession. It's much easier to read, even to preach, stories of God's abundance than to be stuck in the middle of them. Especially when the needs around us seem so overwhelming. How exactly is the God of abundance providing in the midst of the circumstances of our day where families are going hungry and worrying about how to pay the rent, where kids are preparing to go back to school, but not all of them have the resources to provide school supplies, where laws are being passed in so many states that are legalizing voter suppression, that are firmer, further attempting to limit women's rights, that are restricting trans rights, that are perpetuating the separation of families and expanding the criminalization of people of color? And what about the ever-increasing gap between the wealthiest few and the vast numbers who struggle to live day to day? Where is God's Abundance. So many people in this country are acting from fear and from scarcity and from hoarding and from greed that it sometimes seems the only abundance around us is an abundance of scarcity. Myths circulate and all you have to do is turn on the news or talk to people in the community and you'll hear myths of scarcity that there isn't enough money to provide a living wage. There isn't enough money to provide health care for all or affordable housing for our brothers and sisters who are out on the streets. Myths that if we don't grasp tightly to what we have, we will lose it. Rather than opening ourselves to something that is way beyond ourselves. Myths that as things change in this country, and indeed they are changing, that they should be worse for some, rather than better for all. Myths of scarcity and abundance for some were on vivid display this week as Jeff Bezos, founder and executive chairman of Amazon, flew into space and afterwards publicly acknowledged the role that workers, Amazon workers, played in allowing him to accumulate such wealth wealth that was amassed at the expense of workers who were denied the right to unionize, workers who had to demand benefits and who on their Amazon salary could not provide a living wage for their family. Myths of scarcity are alive and well here in Oakland. Myths that we don't have enough money in the city budget to fund violence prevention and violence interruption and community services and safety programs. Myths that our communities will be less safe if we invest in infrastructure and long-term goals 
that benefit not just the poorest of the community, but each and every one of us. Or the myth this week that if we require the Oakland Athletics to invest in our community, like we require of every other business in Oakland, that they will abandon their rootedness in Oakland. Myths of scarcity and very real fears that are behind them are abundant. But it turns out myths of scarcity and fear were abundant in Elisha's day as well, and certainly in Jesus's. Elisha served in the, 19th, in the ninth century before the Common Era, and as one commentator put it, he served in a time of so much strife that his prophetic work occurred in the midst of wars between Syria and Israel. It was a time of great flux and a time of great fear. In fact, the name Elisha means God has granted salvation, a name that was needed but was probably such a hard message for people to trust in the midst of what they faced. Scarcity was the rule of the day. And so in the midst of the scarcity of Elisha's day, I want us to take a closer look at how this miracle of abundance took place. Our story begins with someone who practices stewardship. A man whose name we don't even know. But we know that he came from Ba Shalisha. And we know that he was a God fearing man, or at least that he was willing to obey the commandments of God to bring the first fruits of his crops to God, to a man of God. We know that he was a man who exampled and embodied stewardship. He was a man who was willing to share what he had as God commands us. And as the same commentator who talks about the scarcity and the strife and the fear of Elisha's day comments that this man's gifts must have been a refreshing change a refreshing change to the way people behaved in his day, a refreshing change that demonstrated faithfulness and generosity. This miracle would not have taken place without this man's stewardship. The second thing that was needed for this miracle to take place was Elisha to see the needs of the community. Elisha looked around him and saw hungry people. A hundred of them, the text says. He looks around and he sees hungry people and he sees resources at his disposal because of the community. And he says, we can do something. I can do something. God can do something. And so we have a man who shares his resources. We have Elijah who sees need in his community. And then we have Elisha willing to see not just a hundred people and a small amount of food, but to see the potential for the abundance of God to be manifest in the community. Elisha saw that God's abundance meant that there would be enough for all. 
and not just a little bit for everyone, but enough so that everyone would be filled and there would be some left over. Elisha was able to see not just the scarcity that was apparent to the human eye, the scarcity that his servant saw and fretted with, but Elisha was able to see with a divine vision the opportunity in this situation for God's abundance and God's provision to be revealed. Three essential pieces to this story. Someone willing to share. Someone willing to share resources with God, with God's leaders, knowing that it would ultimately be shared with the community. Someone willing to see need and not walk by and say, there's nothing I can do. And someone willing to say that with human eyes, it might seem like we're in a heap of trouble right now, but with a bigger vision, with divine insight, there are real possibilities here if we open up our hands and seek to share what we have with the larger community. All around us, we see signs of scarcity. But the reality is there is plenty. There is enough. There is more than enough to go around. That is the story of scripture from Adam and Eve to Abraham to the Israelites to Elijah to Elisha to Jesus to us. There's plenty to go around if we are willing to share our resources. There's plenty to go around if we are willing to open our eyes to the needs in the community. And there's plenty to go around if we are willing to trust the divine promise that God's abundance is more than enough, even when it doesn't seem humanly possible to our human eye. I want to share with you an example of when I see, saw these three essential pieces come together in the life of Lakeshore. Many of you saw the Sanctuary Working Group had the opportunity on Friday to share our story with the Baptist Peace Fellowship of North America, an international community, and, and we shared um, we shared four years of what it meant to be a sanctuary congregation, but, but the one story that really illustrates what's going on in the text today about God's provision struck all of us as we were reflecting back on four years. There was one powerful moment, and it took place in July two years ago. You may, and, and for those of you who don't know, our, our congregation made a renewed commitment to sanctuary in 2017, and we had spent a few years uh, accompanying people and getting to know people and advocating in Sacramento and in San Francisco. Um, but then two years ago, and some of you were in this very sanctuary. It was, uh, I, I remember it vividly because it was the day before vacation Bible camp was about to begin, and my plate was full. But a need arose. The president at that time was viciously attacking immigrants and was threatening raids, especially in communities in cities like Oakland that were welcoming of immigrants in our community. And the raids were so real that the mayor of Oakland warned
warned the immigrant community in Oakland to find a safe place to go because the raids were imminent. And our congregation was fearful for our immigrant neighbors. And so we gathered that Sunday and following worship, the call went out, if you can do something, if you feel compelled to be part of this congregation wrestling with what we should do in this circumstance, stay after church. And we had at least 40 people, and on a July Sunday, that's a lot. We had at least 40 people stay after church, and our sanctuary team did a resource mapping of the congregation. If these raids take place, can we open our congregation? And one by one, people said, I'll make meals and bring them to feed those who might come to the congregation. And people said, I'll sleep overnight at the church so that people can stay here all night and feel hosted. And then people began to say, I have a room in my home. If these raids go on more than one, two, three days, we can take someone to my home and I will care for them until it's safe for them to go back to their own home. And people said, I have money. I can't give a room. I can't show up at church. I'm working all day, but I can, I can write a check. I can help fund this project. A few people who had the skills said, I will be a translator. I'll show up and I will help translate because who knows what language people may speak when they come to your church. We will find a way to provide and it was the story of abundance, of people coming together and sharing what they could offer, no one person the same, and together us being able to provide for the larger community. And as it turns out, the threats were only used to terrorize the community, but they didn't come to fruition in the overt mass way that had been publicized. But that event was a transitional moment in the life of our sanctuary congregation because we realized in that moment the amount of resources we had and it was that shift that allowed us during COVID to open our congregation to OSCAR, knowing people would contribute funds it was that shift that allowed us to free someone who was in detention and would not have gotten out had there not been a space and we knew of God's abundance in our congregation if we could only share our resources. Joining us today in worship is my good friend, Reverend Harry Williams. Reverend Harry and I went to seminary together back in 1996. And our paths have crossed over the years and we've done a number of uh, fun things together for the good of the ministry. But when COVID hit, he approached me and he said, Allie, I gotta tell you, I'm really struggling here because I used to rely on coffee shops to do my work each day. My internet at the house isn't that strong, but I'd, I'd go out and I'd sit for hours uh, at Starbucks or at the uh, local deli and, and I'd get my work done and, and now all that places have shut down. Would you be willing to consider opening your sanctuary during COVID when no one else is there anyway and allow me to use your internet? And I checked in with Jim and Jim said, how could we say no? No one's in the building. Someone has a need. Can we share from our abundance? And it wasn't for a few weeks in before I realized, and Jim realized, kind of nice to know that someone is in the building most days of the week. Our abandoned building because everyone is sheltering in place as we're supposed to, and yet, Someone was here kind of checking on things. 
More than once, I needed something from the library, a, a, a piece of paper, or to look something up, and I would call out my friend Harry and say, I know you're at the church, maybe you could help me with something. And, and when Oscar came to stay in this congregation, all by himself, this massive sanctuary area, he had someone to welcome him. He had someone to say hi to him from time to time. Oscar wasn't alone. When we allow ourselves to see the needs around us, when we allow ourselves to look at the needs around us, not just with human eyes, but with divine insight, when we open up our hands to share what we have, even when what we have seems so little, just a drop in the bucket, that's when God's abundance is profoundly manifest, is miraculously manifest. How might Amazon function differently if those in power, if those with the six-figure salaries saw the needs of the workers and opened their hands and cultivated a practice of abundance for there is indeed enough for all. How might we live our lives differently if we open our hearts to see and feel the needs around us? if we open our hands to share what we have, what little we have, whatever it is, but add it to the collective. If we open our eyes and our minds to see the abundance of God, or to trust that somehow God's abundance will be manifest even when we can't see it, because that is what we believe. It is my prayer that we may continue to learn ever more fully of God's abundance and that we may participate in it. Amen. <laughs>